Good morning, everybody. Egunon, right? Should I say? Correct? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to discuss with you <coughs> and address both the industry and the companies and the SMEs in particular and the politicians today. Uh, because I, I strongly believe that uh, we are experiencing a, a very great period. It's uh, for us, for engineers, for people working in the industry, I think it's the, it's the best and the most interesting period in the last 30 years, 40 years maybe. Uh, this is the fourth industrial revolution. It's a great opportunity <clears throat> to improve the competitiveness of our companies, of our SMEs. It's a great opportunity for improving the competitiveness of the SMEs uh, or the whole industrial uh, sectors of Europe. But on the other side, I think uh, we need to understand how to do it. Otherwise, we are going to suffer from that. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with the concept of digital divide. Hmm? Uh, this is normally is a concept that address the divide between uh, young people who are very familiar with digital technologies and the elder people. But the same concept can be applied to SMEs, and uh, that's the problem. We should avoid that those opportunities becomes a threat for our industry. So I would like to share with you my view. I would like to share with you how I think we can transform this into uh, an opportunity. And uh, in order to do that, uh, please be with me uh, uh, in the sense that uh, I always am a very enthusiastic person and think we need to uh, somehow go beyond and have a uh, have dream on what we need to do and uh, always ask ourselves, why not? Hmm? If you start to ask ourselves, why not? Can we do it differently? Can we go beyond what people say, what people understand? I think we, have, we are on the right, uh, on the right way. Uh, a lot is happening, you know it. Uh, and uh, all of this has an impact on the, on the current uh, situation. We have, uh, can I have the slides here? Can I please, otherwise? Uh, thank you so much. We are going to have demographic changes all over the world. Uh, we are going to have scarcity of natural resources more and more. Raw material are becoming scarce. I'm not just referring to oil. I'm referring to, for example, all the rare earth elements, which are very important. Uh, urbanization of the population is, is something that is moving. Uh, people is moving where companies are going to move. And all of this has an impact on, on the future. And we need to understand this. This is not something which is different from, from manufacturing. We need to understand this when we design our factory, when we design our product, when we decide where to put our, our factories. And more complex is due to the fact that products are changing. You know this, I'm talking with experts. Uh, so you know that products are smart, product will be connected. And this is uh, something that we have been focusing in the last years. But mm, we should not forget that customers wants to have daily Always green product is very more is very important. When you go to buy a washing machine, a dishwasher, you're looking for the energy class of it, and uh, and in the near future we will have more energy classes, and uh, and people will still be looking at something which is not smart, which is connected, but is also which is green, and customization, personalization. Uh, do you know how many variants you have if you buy a normal standard car? Two hundred. 300 variants? No. It's uh, roughly between 7,800 variants. And if you buy a luxury car, uh, the last SUV from, uh, from Lamborghini is 40,000 variants. Hmm? So you can combine it and have your own personalized product. And this is making a challenge on the supply chain because you want it personalized, but you want to have a lot of services included with it. And uh, the concept of servitization is not new. But this is adding complexity on the kind of product. Hmm? Uh, we started many years ago to make product and sell products. And then the customer wants more. That we had a first uh, circle around the product. Uh, and then the customer wants more and more. We added a third cycle of what we call, we used to call the uh, services around the product. But today, in many cases, in many opportunity, customer, they just want the service. But what is the mistake here? Is that people think, oh, the future is service. Let's go there. Be careful. Why? Because those kind of services are always based on real products. 
If you talk about car sharing, you still need a car. If you talk about bike sharing, you still need a bike. The way to design the car, the way to design the bike should change. And that's, I think, for, for the designer, for the engineers, is a challenge that we need, we need to take. And time to market, reduction, time. Time is going to be a key challenge. Let, let me say something personal which happened to me, just to let you to understand how the customer is in the future willing to have everything the day after. Uh, I guess many of you are used to buying product on Amazon. I do. And a few, three years ago, three years ago, my, my, child, my daughter, she was five years. And I went to buy a new car and I went to the dealer and the dealer promised to me to get the car in three months. And I was so disappointed. I went back home in the, in the evening and I was sharing this with my family. And my daughter, she was eating, having the dinner, and without looking at me, she said, hey, dad, I have a solution for you, right? Why don't you go on Amazon? You will deliver your car the day after, the day tomorrow. <laughs> she is five years old. Listen, this is a customer of tomorrow. The customer of tomorrow wants every single variance of the 40,000 possible variants the day after. And this is a big challenge for us, not only for B2C, but also for B2B, time. And I should not address this to you because if you are here, you know what manufacturing is and why manufacturing is important, right? But I think we need to um, share something. Um, I'm sorry that I, Italy is highlighted, but you see Spain is, is there. Uh, so I was discussing with my governments uh, some years ago, and they say, no, we are not a manufacturing country. Why should we invest in Industry 4.0? We are not. Uh, China is a manufacturing country. South Korea is a manufacturing country. But if 15% of your GDP is from manufacturing, uh, the government should focus on the remaining 85%. That was what the politicians said. And then I showed this slide to them. And I said, listen, look at this. Is it true? If you only look at the manufacturing sectors strictly defined, but a manufacturing sector means logistics, means ICT, means banking, finance, uh, maintenance. There are a lot of services, industries, around the core of the manufacturing. So if 15% is uh, 100, then you add 30, 35%, it means more than 55% of the national GDP. This is why we should consider manufacturing. Manufacturing is an enabler of a lot of economy, is an enabler of the R&D. 95% of the trade in the world is manufacturing. More than 90% of the R&D is because of manufacturing. Innovation is coming from manufacturing. I think we need to be proud of this, and we need to put back manufacturing at the core of our, our policy, and I'm happy to see that uh, the audience here is, uh, the room is plenty of, of people, because I think that all of you trust this and behave this, and uh, I think you should, ca can be somehow uh, witnessing this and advertising this. Uh, but what to do? How to do it? What is the traditional view of Industry 4.0? Hmm? You know this. You have been since this. We are the fourth industrial revolution, cyber physical system, blah, blah, blah. You know this. And uh, I think you have been shared these slides or something like this. IoT, big data, artificial intelligence, cyber physical systems additive manufacturing, new human-machine interfaces. All of these technologies are considered somehow industry 4.0 technology, and I do agree. I mean, this is where we started some, some years ago, right? And, uh, and I think this is still relevant, and we should start from this, but, but. And uh, this is a, a, a factory 4.0, everything is connected, machines are connected, uh, fine, no problem. I do agree with that, but. I think we, it's a time now to have a different view, a different perspective. I think it's time to enlarge our view because the risk is that if we just call Industry 4.0, if we just focus on the term Industry 4.0, if we just focus on this view, we can do some improvement, we can do some competitiveness, increase, but I think we are not going to uh, get all the possible benefit that we can get 
uh, from those technologies. And, uh, and that's what I would like to share with you. And let me see how I will be a little bit provocative, but uh, it's fine. First, I like to call this not just a revolution or industrial revolution. I think this is a revolution of the revolution. It's, it's more complex than just this. This is a, it's a cultural revolution, top right. Um, this is everywhere. Uh, we have been connected with this object for 15 years, and now we are connecting machines. Uh, we connected people first, and now we are connecting machines. This is a revolution which started in their normal life, in the social life, and then went to factories, to companies. This is the other way around. If you look at the first and second industrial revolution where they started in the factories, and then they went to the society. So people are used to be connected. Now we need to connect machines, we need to connect robots, we need to connect the rest first. Second, if you look at the spread or the time which was needed to spread all the technologies during the first and second, the third industrial revolution. It's uh, 50 years in some cases, even 100 years in some other cases. It's slow enough to allow the society to adjust to the new technologies. But this revolution, it's very fast, it's quick. Five years, 10 years. You can buy a new machine and adopt a new technology. But what about people? You cannot buy new people in 10 years. If you want to change the mentality, if you need, want to change approach, if you need to upskill workers, you need more than five years, 10 years. If you want to change the mentality, you need time. And that's the problem. I think the most inertia will not come from the technology, will come from the people, will come from the workers. And that's the, that's the problem here, and I think it's uh, something we need to take care of. And then it's everywhere. It's per me, it's everywhere. It's not only industry, it's not only society. We are using the same technology everywhere. And that's changing our life. The, the concept of a factory, the concept of supply chain changes. Uh, we are always connected. We cannot say, oh, okay, I pay you for eight hours work. You work 24 hours a day, seven days a week if you want, right? So this is changing the way we pay people, the way we pay contract. And that's are the challenges here. So now, let me share with you my view, how to go beyond, how to fully exploit it. First, don't, I don't like to speak, to talk about Internet of Things anymore. Because if I think about Internet of Things, it means we are collecting things, machines. A, fa a company is much more. A company is made by people. A company is made by processes, is made by services. You don't touch a service. A service is not a thing. It exists, but you don't touch it. You don't touch business processes, but you need to collect them. You need to connect them. You need to collect people with people, people with machines, machines with processes. So open your mind. Uh, Internet of X of everything, whatever you, you want to call it, I think it's, uh, it's the way we should go first. Second, data. Uh, I went to my colleague, I'm, I'm coming from a, a management environment. I went to a colleague of mine and I said, can you remember me, remind me what was the theory of the creation of value? And he, he went on the whiteboard and designed hmm, process, output, and then I said, what are the input? And he said, oh Marco, come on, you know it. Huh? Raw material, workers, jobs, hmm, people, and capital, technology machines. And I said, and how do you can measure the productivity? Come on, Marco. It's output divided people, output divided raw material, output divided capital. Ah, okay. Where are the data, I ask him. Data? No. They are not a factor of production. What do you mean? I have said. No, it's, uh, these are data, are input if you talk about, I don't know, Google or Facebook, but for a manufacturing company, data are not considered uh, an input. And if you look at the balance sheet of the company at the end of the year, you don't see 
data in the balance sheet. So there is no value for data. Hmm? This is what we are teaching today to our students. It's a huge mistake. Data should be considered for the right value they have. Hmm? Uh, we are not used to consider it yet. Huh? Because we don't know how to measure the value of data. We don't know how to consider it. But you know that data are very important. We should change the way we take decisions. Uh, most, of the, most of the most successful entrepreneurs, they say, oh, I took decisions because I'm, I know what to do. I have always been done. But data-based decisions are very important and more important than the future, even for the best and most important entrepreneur. And that's, I think, we, we should consider data as a raw material. Uh, I'm talking about manufacturing company. Eh? I'm not talking about company processing data. I'm talking about real companies producing real physical product. Data should be, I would like that in the near future, we will be able to measure the productivity of data. That's something we need to do, and that's our challenge. Three, uh, you know this, right? I already use it. Um, that's focus on the factory. Connect the factory, connect the machines within the factory. No, go beyond. I would like that we stop to discuss about Industry 4.0. I would like that we start to discuss, to talk about value chain for Pazir. I was having a very nice dinner last night with my, a friend of mine, a new friend, huh? and we were discussing about the importance of the supply chain for Airbus. Right? This is it's true for any companies. If you are successful as an OEM, you need to consider that you are successful if the whole value chain is successful. Connecting machine with machine is fine. We should connect companies with companies. First year, second year, third year. Um, my suggest, you, you remember 20 years ago we did the, with the lean manufacturing. Lean manufacturing was very important. The largest company implemented the lean manufacturing in their own factory, but what they did? Afterwards, they went to their supplier and they coached the supplier, they trained the supplier to implement lean manufacturing. We should do the same. We should use the large OEM companies and go to the SMEs of the supply chain and teach them, train them, involve them in the Industry 4.0 concept. Otherwise, the digital divide will not make uh, the whole value chain profitable. Automation. Uh, people say, oh, with Industry 4.0, with automation, we are going to lose jobs. This will increase the uh, unemployment rate. This is bad. Hmm? I don't know. Maybe. Not sure. I don't think so. Uh, we need to think that the new concept of automation is coming, and this concept of automation can help people, can help workers to keep their job. Huh? Uh, cognitive automation is the future. Again, let me, uh, we, take, we took this, we put it here on the arm of our workers. The workers were receiving real-time information on what to do. This is not a, this is a state-of-the-art technology now. This worker improved his productivity by 20% just because he was not losing any more time, looking for tools, papers, designs, blueprints, and so on and so forth. 20% productivity. What the company did, they keep the worker. They didn't invest in the robots. So the company saved the money, and the worker keeps the job. It's a win-win situation. Cognitive automation, I think it's, it's very important. And this is something that we need to look at in the future. And lean. Please, uh, I'm looking at the consultant. Uh, I think there are many consultants here, right? I, we need, I am a consultant also somehow. I, I'm teaching companies and say what I have to do. But please, do not forget the nice effort we did in the last 20 years to make our processes more lean and more, more profitable. Digitalization is fine, but we need to apply digitalization on nice, clean, lean process. Otherwise, we are going to digitalize the waste, right? So be careful. Digital system is fine, but lean, don't forget to be lean. Uh, otherwise, we, we forget the, all, what we did in the past. And services 4.0. That's, it's not industry, it's service. Hmm? 
um, I can make uh, many examples. I, I have one example, I like it. It's, uh, it's about um, a jewelry in Paris. They put a camera, and the camera can uh, read the emotion of the customer, because when the customer approaches the, the window of the shop, there are jewels moving on, on a round table. So if there is a nice uh, product, you say, wow. If there is a product you don't like, maybe you change your face. All of these data are analyzed by the by image recognition algorithm. Those data are sent in the shop. Uh, and when you enter the jewelry, only the jewels that you like are shown to you, and not the other one. This has improved the sales of that shop by 35%. Hmm? This is dangerous for men. Be careful now, it's Christmas time is coming. Don't go to Paris, right? But uh, be careful, or we can apply to shoe, shoes for, for ladies, the same, right? But it's, uh, be careful. But you see, those are the same technologies applied to a different business. Where are the opportunities? Reshoring. A robot has the same price here and in China. Those technologies have the same price here and in, in the Far East. Now, let's put two enablers together. The technologies at the same price here and there. Second, we said that customer wants to have their product tomorrow in a very highly personalized manner. Now, you can't make it in China and have one month of logistics delivery to here. It doesn't work. You need to make it here, close to the market, and that is an opportunity for Europe, right? Reshoring is enabled by Industry 4.0. Reshoring is enabled by Industry 4.0. We should consider this. And I hope that our politicians understand this because they need to make it to, to, to help our company to understand this and they give them some maybe uh, fiscal benefit to, to establish back factories here. Uh, but now, how to convince your boss? that Industry 4.0 can be profitable. How to convince your, your entrepreneur, how to convince you to get money, how to convince you that there is profitability here? Because, you know, it's nice to talk about technology and if we are all enthusiastic and if I go and say, give me money for a nice uh, software, <coughs> does it pay back? Right, that's the question. Uh, we did a survey. Uh, we have been using data for one bank in Italy, uh, but this applies to all Europe, I'm sure. And we analyzed from 2010 to 2015 uh, more than 4,600 companies. The blue line is showing the performances of this company. Hmm? You see the turnover of the company. Um, uh, you see that there was um, increased and a little bit of a crisis, you, you know that, right? And then, out of this 4,600 company, there have been 72 which declare to have been done Industry 4.0 related investment. Whatever, it could be IoT, artificial intelligence, some collaborative robots, some of them were additive manufacturing, so on and so forth. And we have compared the performances. And you see that the 72 company, you should look at the red uh, line, hmm? they increase their turnover. Hmm? Uh, it's 8% more than the other one. Good news. Yes. But you are not interested in turnover. You are interested in uh, the fr profitability of the company, right? So we look at the profitability. EBITDA on the left. Return on investment on the right, you see that those companies, let me say the, the red ones, hmm, were already more profitable than the others. 7.2% uh, versus 5.8%. You should look at here, right? Okay. But you see that, of course, this was the crisis, and then the profitability went up again. But you see, these companies, they kept the same level of profitability over the five years, hmm? while the other one who have invested in digital technology, they have improved their profitability. It doesn't matter how you measure it. Huh? 
37% because it's 9.9 .9 over 7.2, and here I think it's 47, 6.1 over 3.8. Wow. I mean, this should convince you that if you invest in, in, uh, in digital technology, you can have a positive return on investment. And then we went to the workers. That's the other side of the coin. Look at here. This was the average full cost salary per employee. And you see that it remained more or less the same over the five year period. And if you look at the, let's call the, the red companies, the cost of the work, the cost of the employees was higher. What does it mean? It means that they were using more skilled workers, of course. And the cost even increased by 10%. So this can be seen as a bad news. We pay more our workers. You pay more because you need more skilled people, which I will get to this point in a, in a while. But if you look at here, at the right side, hmm? so labor costs, no increase in productivity. Why? Look at the side, added value per employee. It remains the same here. But if you look at the added value per employee of the red companies, you see it has increased by 25%. 92 over 73. So, only 10% of increase of labor costs, but 25% of increase of productivity. Huh? It means that technologies were boosting the productivity of the people. This is something that we know forever, since, since ever, right? But that's a proof that if you invest in Industry 4.0, you can have a positive return on investment. I mean, these are data, neutral data coming from banks, right? So uh, it's something that is not here, which I did for advertise. Now, that's why, let me, let me do the professor a little bit. I mean, I'm I, uh, okay. a small, simple formula, right? <laughs> we should increase, enlarge, extend the concept of productivity. It's not productivity of the workers and technology anymore. We should add the productivity of the data. Think in this way, and this is the way we should, we should look. And, and let me convince you that if we work on this, productivity, we will improve the number of workers, not reduce the number of workers. We, this can be an opportunity to hire more people. And let me try to explain you what do I mean. Look at this. If my technology becomes more productive, I need less people. That's the concept of productivity, right? But if I'm becoming more productive, my cost goes down, my prices goes down, I sell more product, I sell more volume. And since we are in an open market, we are competing in a global environment, the increase of volume means more people. Now, I'm convinced that an increase of volume, which means increase of people, is higher than the decrease of people due to the increase of productivity. That's what we need to look at for in the, in the medium to long perspective. So that's an opportunity for increase the, the job. I, I just give you two examples here. Germany and Korea. South Korea are the two countries with the highest number of robots per capita in the world. They are and they have a very low unemployment rate. So it's not true that robots are creating unemployability. It's not true. Look at those two countries. And you can do the same. If you increase the productivity of workers, the same. You need less worker, but less worker, more productive, increase of the volume, more people. Again, increase the number of jobs. But what do you need? You need competences. Uh, in Italy, we did, with our national industrial plan, we did the uh, hyper depreciation on machines. So companies now can uh, buy com uh, machines for, for a lower price. But at the same time, we put money on training and skills. Because if you give me a new machine, but I'm not able to, to drive it. I'm not getting all the benefit for the new machines. And data. How to increase the productivity of the people? How to increase the productivity of machines? Data, data. You see, data are coming back, and I think those are at the core of our, uh, of our problem. So maybe it's a little bit complicated as a model, maybe, 
but this is to sh explain you why we should invest in data and we should invest in skills and, and people. That was the nice point, <laughs> but cybersecurity. I think uh, I will learn you just had it here an event on, uh, one month ago on, on cybersecurity, more than 1,000 people. Nice. But we should not be, you don't stop driving just because there are car accidents, right? You just make uh, more safe, safer roads and safer car. Same for here. SME digital divide, I already discussed it. Be careful. Large company, they know what to do. SME doesn't. SME need to be helped. We need to help them to understand what's going on. And I think the events like this are important. And skills. What are the skills of the future? I, I can share you, we, we did a, a study. We have identified more than 200 skills of Industry 4.0. That's something I can share with you if, you if you like. And this was addressed to the companies. And, uh, but let me use a few words to, to politicians, right? Because I think that uh, we need to create the proper environment for, for company. I'm also the scientific chairman of the World Manufacturing Forum. I see some friends here. We created this together. Um, we did a, a study, which was presented last uh, September at the, at the World Manufacturing Forum. We came up with 10 key recommendations. Those are the recommendations uh, for the future of manufacturing. Those are recommendations for all of us. Let me use the remaining eight minutes to explain them. What, what is the, the World Manufacturing Forum? First, it's a, it's, it's a global initiative. Uh, it's an open platform. You can join it, we can do it together, because I think that we have, we, means me and you, have a mission together. Um, I have two daughters, right? So, and I, so two jokes, okay, one for each daughter. I, don't worry, only two, so there will be no more jokes. But the, the oldest one, she came back uh, some years ago and, and she was in the primary school and she said, hey dad, what's your job? I said, you know it, I'm teaching how to design factories. Dad, you are awful. I don't want to speak with you anymore. And I said, what do you mean? Yes, because my teacher at school says to me that factories are polluting. So you teach how to pollute the environment. Eight years old, right? Uh, I said, why? Who should that? My teacher. So the teacher was teaching that factories are polluting. If you give these wrong messages to children, we are facing a problem in the, in the near future. That's why this kind of initiatives, I think, are very important. We came up with 10 recommendations. Cultivate a positive perception of manufacturing. This is our own responsibility of everybody. Uh, we should go back home and explain to people that, can I say manufacturing is sexy, right? Can I say that? Huh? It's nice, it's fun. It's not true, you can find jobs. It's not true that it's dirty, it's it's awful. It's not true anymore. Huh? Blue collar are white collar today, right? If they use data, they will turn up. We need new people. We need new competences. And, and, and this is the future of the, of the world. Manufacturing creates jobs. Manufacturing is a peacekeeper, as I like to say. Skills and education, of course, are needed. Uh, companies in Italy are not able to find the proper skills, and I think it's the same here. We need to improve this. We need to promote new type of skills, new type of competences. Hmm? Cognitive-based skills, for example. We need to train and educate the young people. We need to train the workers. We need to work on the whole life of people. Develop effective policies to support global business initiatives. Be careful. Standards are important. Regulations are important. But the risk is that if you make too strict regulation, and now I'm talking to our friends in Brussels, uh, you, the risk is that you stop innovation. Artificial intelligence is a great initiative, is a great technology. We should make sure that we do not stop the innovation in artificial intelligence. Rules are needed, I do agree. Data privacy is very important, but we should avoid that to make too strict regulation. Infrastructure. We build roads, we build ray tracks in the past. Uh, we need to build uh, connectivity now. Bandwidth is very important. It's, it's, it's something that I was impressed. I met at the World Manufacturing Forum, I met the Minister of Digitalization of Thailand. Minister of Digitalization. Hmm? 
Thailand. He said that by the end of the next semester, every single village in Thailand will have fiber connection. Every single village in all over the country. This is a, a huge investment, but this is the way to make the productivity of the country. <laughs> Ecosystem for manufacturing innovation. I, there are a lot of startups here. I saw a lot of stands. That's great. But startups need to be helped. And manufacturing startups are different from IT startups. And IT startups can be me, my laptop, sitting in my home, some connection, and I can become billionaire, right? Manufacturing startups, it's a little bit different. The cost of the technology is higher. The cost of machines is higher. We need to help them in a different way. Workplaces, attractive workplaces for all. Uh, let me capture the attention of the ladies here, right? Uh, manufacturing has been considered for years something for men, right? Which is true because it was, you, need, you need the muscles, right? To weigh those products and so on and so forth. But if the future becomes digital, if the new skill is not the muscles, it's the brain, uh, uh, manufacturing will not be just for men, it will be for everyone, for women. It will be for any kind of people in the world, right? I do think that Industry 4.0, those kind of technologies, are an enabler uh, for, for solving the gender issue and the gender problem in, in any companies. Socially oriented product. You, I talk about uh, aging of the population. I talk about uh, segments, uh, personalization. We should think on designing products which somehow are oriented to specific segments. And this is possible. It's possible to make money out of it. Um, I learned a project between uh, one largest multinational uh, company making yogurt and the Yunus uh, Foundation. I guess you know the Yunus Foundation. They solved the problem in Bangladesh. The problem in Bangladesh was that children were suffering from a lot of disease because, the, because of malnutrition. They were not getting the proper uh, food. So what they did, they created a new kind of yogurt, taste for the children, but they put all the right ingredients in it. And this was sold for a reasonable price. So the company made money anyhow, huh? but the malnutrition problem in Bangladesh was solved, and the government uh, saved a lot of money because there were no need to, to take care of the children anymore. So this is a very nice example of fact that we can design products which are socially rented. We can still make money after that, but be social at the same time. SMEs. We discussed about digital divide. Hmm? So we should help them. Uh, we should understand that there is a great potential there. We should keep them uh, with us. Data. Cognitive manufacturing, data. What is the value of the data? We need to understand it. We need to explain to people that the data are, are, are very important. And, uh, and I think this is something we need to invest time. Resource efficiency. Be careful. Uh, we talk about green product, it's fine. Green factory is fine. But if we make too strict sustainability rules for developing country, we will stop their development. So we need to make agreements which take into consideration uh, the specificity of the country. Country-specific policies are needed. We cannot make a policy for it. It will not work. You can get the report here. That's uh, for free, and I will invite you to get it. Um, of course, also, I can make a small announcement, maybe that next year, uh, if, I, if you allow me, uh, because of what we are discussing. That will be in September 2019. You can join us. It's, it's by invitation only, but you will be invited by, by, the, by the local government. Save the date. And uh, my last slide is, hmm. you know this, right? Uh, this is. Uh, you know it? Only three people? No, come on. Ah, okay, 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 okay. This is a, a piece of the Matrix, the movie. Hmm? And uh, you know that there is a one, one moment when um, uh, Morpheus, hmm? 
who is the one of the two main character, is explained to the to the other character, you have an option in front of you. Uh, you can take the blue pill and uh, forget our talk and our discussion. You can take the blue pill tonight, go back home and forget about me, okay? And uh, you will not see the future, but you will think uh, to be happy. Or you take the red pill, and a new life, a new world uh, will open in front of you. It's a challenging world, but that's the future, and you decide what to take. Huh? I hope you go back home and take uh, the red pill today. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>